So it was, it was really complex to be running my business, keeping it profitable, selling my business, keeping secrets from some of my closest people, and trying to have a life outside of that. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realized that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. I'm excited to bring to you today my conversation with Miss Amber Percival. I've known her for several years now, and over the last year plus, she's been going through the process of selling her multi-generational business. And this was happening while I was writing a book on negotiation, and we had stayed in touch. And the insights and her experience, I thought, would be extremely valuable to share with a much larger audience. And you are really going to enjoy this episode. So who is Amber? Well, Amber grew up north of the border, and she is Canadian. She attended Seneca Polytechnic. And while initially I didn't think they had sports, therefore I couldn't ask about the mascot, false In Canada, on their websites, they make you work a little bit for it, but they do. Their mascot, the Sting. It's like this red hornet bee thing that I don't think it's a real animal. Anyway, the Seneca Sting. Anyway, so she graduated from Seneca Polytechnic, and she was working in IT when she was drawn back into the family hearth business, distribution and retail, which she talks about. And she initially went from, hell no, this would never be my future, to, it is my future, I love it, and she bought the business from her mother. So for the better part of the last two decades, she has been involved with a company that became Urban Hearth until she entered into negotiations to sell the business, of which she did. And that's the story that we are going to tell, and I think there are lots of elements here that you will find relevant because it's a multi-generational small business and the topics we cover range from negotiation and concessions to the emotions of keeping secrets from employees when you are entering into a possible sale and to the general pressures that owners find themselves under, especially during a sale opportunity that goes on for many, many months. Given the recency of the sale and the finalization of selling Urban Hearth, I certainly would have understood if Amber did not want to join the podcast, but I'm thrilled that she did. And I promise you, you are in for a treat. You are going to enjoy listening to Amber, and I guarantee you're going to take at least one or two things to help you be a more thoughtful leader and manager. So as always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy my conversation with Miss Amber Percival. Miss Amber Percival, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brad. I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, You and I, uh, through text and over the phone for the last several years, I've gotten to know each other well, understand your business, and I got to ride, if not in the passenger seat, I feel like if you were in a pickup (laughs) truck, I was like, I was in the bed and I would occasionally knock on the little window and shove my little face through the window and be like, <laughs> what's happening now? And you would kind of let me know. So um, with us kind of talking about negotiation and talking about the really emotional aspects of selling your business when and we're going to talk about how you acquired the business from your mother and how you have family working there. And then you have a lot of people that a lot of talent there that felt like family, but let's Let's start at the beginning. Take me back to a 12-year-old Amber. Geographically, where were you and what were you passionate about then? Mm, that's such a good question. No warning on that question, too. No, I love no, that. No, no, you, you'll be fine. You know yourself. <laughs> 12-year-old Amber. I lived in Perth, Ontario, and my mom owned a Oh, my mom was chimney sweeping at that time, I believe. And my dad was a motorcycle mechanic. We lived way back on like 300 acres of bush. 
And my greatest passion as a child was the forest. And, you know, somehow made it to adulthood after tasting everything in the forest. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So really, like, I have always, I was raised an only child until my parents divorced, actually at 12. So I've spent a lot of time alone in wilderness. And uh, that remains a passion for me to this day. Few questions there. I had to look (laughs) on a map. I should have known this. I have family who lives in Toronto and -hmm. live in Windsor, Ontario. Turns out once you really look at the the provinces of Canada, it's a little bit larger than I anticipated. Ontario is rather large. So how would you describe, for maybe some of our audience that lives in the United States, where is Perth exactly? So uh, the, the nation's capital is Ottawa, and we're about an hour west of Ottawa. It's a rural community with about 6,000 people. All right. I was going to say, you go to Syracuse, you go north, <laughs> don't drive into Lake Ontario, and then keep going, and you run into Perth. I don't know, Mike. I didn't map quest it, but my guess would be, I don't know, three or four hours maybe? Does that sound right, or less than that? So it's a couple hours to Syracuse. Yeah, I've flown out of Syracuse before for some okay. American destinations. So it's, a, it's actually pretty easy to get to from here. Okay. I have, to, <laughs> I have to ask, you say chimney sweep. My mind goes to Mary Poppins. What exactly was your mother doing? What was the labor? The labor was really going out to people's homes and sweeping their chimneys like farms and at that time you know in the early 80s chimneys were running horizontally through houses to provide extra like secondary heat that you of course wouldn't get from the stove because they weren't high efficiency so she was working on a farm and she was working doing chimney sweeping and you know doing all of the things to to make ends meet for our family and so she was really getting dirty getting in the set and she's always been that person who's super hands-on with everything so that was like the beginning of our family's entry into wood stove business, essentially. Yeah, maybe walk me through that. What set of circumstances led to your mother investing in a wood stove business? So she started working for a friend of hers who owned a wood stove store, and she fell in love with it. She absolutely loved it. And at the time, wood stoves were not regulated. I mean, this is the 80s. It's like cowboy country out there. People are building wood stoves in their garages. And there was a couple of manufacturers that started building wood stoves. And there was efforts towards certification and regulation. And she decided to start her own wood stove store. So from scratch, she started a wood stove store in Perth, Ontario called Embers. She was the salesperson and the installer. She had family members and friends who helped install and work for her. But she was inspired by a woman named Jan Harold, who was like a pioneer in the wood stove industry and is well known by a lot of and respected. She's passed away, unfortunately. But she said, like, if Jan can do it, I can do it. And she started a wood stove store and she worked really hard to support regulation of wood stoves, certification. She sold certified wood stoves and chimneys. And she really believed in the fact that the wood stove is really the heart of the home. People gather around the fire and that's really meaningful. Memories are made there. And she wanted that to be safe and efficient. She cared about the environment even then. She's definitely a hippie. I don't think she'll mind me saying that. And in her own like very humble way became this like super inspirational leader to so many other people who were like, wait a minute, she can do it. I can do it. You know, that same feeling. And how old were you when your mother began this journey to kind of start, just bootstrap her own business? Yeah, I was, you know, she might have even had embers by the time I was 12 and the chimney sweeping might have been like on the way out by then. She was still sweeping chimneys with the store, but she had the store from the time that I was quite young. Like I can remember as a kid playing in the retail store and as a teenager, it was like fully fledged. Her new partner was a wood stove installer and a gas fitter and that's how she met him. And he came to live here, uh, my stepdad, and he worked with her in that business And this is really the birth of Urban Hearth, which is the business that, you know, Mm. we connected on. When I was in my 20s, I was living in Toronto and I was working in sales uh, for a technical company that installed computer systems and libraries. I was traveling all over Brazil and the United States selling and installing computer systems to um, to libraries. And it was a great job and I loved it. But I met somebody who lived in Ottawa and we started dating. And my mom said, like, you're on this, this crazy job. You're never home move to Perth, work in my wood stove store. You can buy a house in Perth. You can't do that in Toronto and come sell wood stoves. 
And I was like, what? No, all like education and all this time in the city. And I'm just going to go work in a wood stove store. But I thought about it and it seemed, you know, like a great opportunity to own a home and to be closer to my partner. So I did. I moved home. I took a massive pay cut to work in a wood stove store as a salesperson. And I loved it. I loved it. I loved understanding her business. I love talking to customers. People buy a fireplace for their home and it is exciting. No one ever gets excited about a library computer system. Not really, no. <laughs> but like, I agree. The, Those do sound like two very different buying situations with a lot of different emotions involved in them. Yeah. So one of my most satisfying sales moments, and I'll never forget it. This man came into the store and I had maybe been working there a couple of years. And he said, I'm here to buy a wood stove. And I was like, whoa, you don't seem super stoked about this. And he was like, oh yeah, okay. it's just a wood stove. I was like, what do you really want? He's like, well, what I really want is a big stone fireplace in the corner and also this and that. He describes this like gorgeous, I have goosebumps. He describes this like gorgeous stone fireplace. And I was like, what's stopping you from getting that? Because you are not excited about this wood stove. And he was like, I don't, I don't really, I guess I just, I, guess, I don't know. And I was like, do you want to talk about what you actually want? <laughs> he was like, yeah. So that's what we did. And I, I'll never forget that I sold him and mom helped me to, learn how to design fireplaces. So I designed his fireplace, hired the mason, did all the things. And he ended up with this like gorgeous showpiece in his home. And he came back later and showed me pictures and thanked me. And I was like, this is the shit. This, this is, is it. Yes. Like, this is where you get to be in people's homes in a way forever. And it's meaningful for them. Right. So that was huge for me when I realized there could be that sense of um, pleasure and connection and joy from sales that I hadn't experienced before. And we miss that sometimes, right? Well, I, th I think to label that like immediately in my mind, it was like a sales story, but I think to label that probably doesn't do it justice when they come in and what you're trying to figure out is what does this person really want? Because an answer <laughs> could have been, Oh, you know, you want the, uh, how do you pronounce it? Jotel, Hotel, Hotel? What is it? <laughs> oh, it's none of those, but I love all those guesses. What? It's Yotul, and someone from Norway would be embarrassed with my pronunciation, so don't <laughs> feel that. <laughs> well, for all our Norwegian listeners, I apologize. Well, anyway, I've got to know that brand just through you. But you could have just said, oh, yeah, here's the uh, MKE4299, and let me show it to you. And just ignore... Like really just take the information that came out of his mouth at face value. You said you wanted something, here it is, right? Versus what we do around here should get you excited. If you're not excited, that's a problem. And let's talk yeah. about that. And my guess is sometimes people think it's, it's out of their budget or take too long or it's impossible. But I also feel, and maybe this could be a transition to talking about you acquire the business from your mother and then how you think about your employees and maybe just transition us to when this offer came in to buy, buy your business, because I think the way you felt about this person, about thinking about what do they really want and can I help them get something they're super excited about that can change their life, that they can build memories around this thing. But that goes to what we do as a job. This is it, right? How we employ people, how we collaborate, what we build. So maybe take that any any way you want. But I just wanted to highlight that because I think this speaks to a gift that you have and some people have it to differing degrees, but I also think it's something that can be learned. You can really learn to attune your ability to see if people are excited, does it give them energy or does this draw energy and how we can collaborate. So I mean, life's short, right? How can we do something cool together? You know? Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you for that invitation. So the year I moved back and started working at the wood stove store, my mom and Mitch, my stepdad found this gas fireplace they loved and they needed to sell it, but it wasn't sold. And my mom being like a serial entrepreneur was like, okay, well, we'll just start a distribution company. Like other people can do it. I can do it. So <laughs> we did. The three of us started the distribution company and we ran the retail store and the distribution company in parallel for four years. And all of us were putting in crazy amount of work hours. And that was fine because, you know, I was 
in my twenties and, you know, mom was in her forties and we had that juice, right? We could do it. But after four years, it became clear. It was a conflict. Our business was growing. We had some great brands and it's a conflict to be selling at retail when you have retail customers. And as a distributor, it can be a conflict. In our case, it was, we had close by customers. So we decided to sell the retail store and we moved strictly into di distribution. So the distribution company was born in 2004. We did it full time without Embers after 2008. Um, in 2012, my stepdad passed away suddenly. And so my mom and I and our small, at that time, very small staff, there was only four of us, five of us in total. Mitch passed, so it left us with four had to kind of reconfigure our business after losing our tech. You know, he was our main warehouse person. He was our tech person. So we, we did, we reconfigured our business. We hired some more people. We continued to grow. This was the thing. Like we were just doing what we loved in a way that we loved to do it. And brands were kind of, were talking to us. We were adding brands. We were getting bigger, but we were still holding the, the attitudes of what we've always called ourselves, which is a boutique distribution company, high quality products that don't need a lot of care and support because they are so well built and we know that the manufacturers back them. So we had always looked at everything through that lens. Can we do an amazing, exceptional job with this brand? And if the answer is no, we won't carry it or we will stop carrying it if that's what our finding. And that served us really, really well. We treated every customer as a priority. If somebody was, if somebody was having a hard time, we dropped everything to deal with it. And that's, that's how that business was running until the day I sold it. So we, of course, during this time became uh, friendly with other distributors in Canada and the States because we went to all of the same meetings. Mm -hmm. And one in particular was a distributor from Quebec that sold almost all of the same brands as us. So, uh, it'll be two years ago in April, I got a phone call. We'd love to meet. Let's have a chat. We want to talk to you about something. We've got an idea. Let's talk. And of course I immediately was like, they want to, they want to buy my business. And I had been like, I just kind of, I niggling, I just knew it, you know, you have a feeling. And I've learned a long time ago to trust my gut and trust my intuition. So at that point I had owned Urban Hearth for five years. I had bought it from my mom and I had just the year before purchased the buildings and the real estate that it's on. So one piece of property. And then I myself bought an adjacent piece of property as well to support the growth of the business. And so I was still new to being a business owner, like five years in, it was still really fresh. But like many people in our industry, I was starting to ask a lot of questions about the future of our industry. Were we going to be regulated out? And what would that look like? How do people who are great at shipping, inventorying and selling things continue to thrive and grow? And as a business owner, I don't think I'd be alone in saying that it was something that kept me up at night. How do I continue to employ myself and these fantastic people in perpetuity with all of this uncertainty and pressure and fear? So many distribution companies were merging and manufacturers were going direct. It felt like there was threats from all over and I was just kind of baseline stressed. And after COVID, I was also exhausted. So it was a welcome phone call, even though I didn't really know if that's what it was about. Well, I remember right around this time, and for some obvious reasons, legal and otherwise, I'm we're going to uh, haze over some of the details. But I remember you had reached out and kind of gave me a heads up, and you had some initial concerns because, and I think we're we're going to be fine here. There was two gentlemen versus one female. You had an intuition, or I think at that point, maybe no evidence yet, but some current concern just about kind of the gender roles a little bit, but maybe also some cultural norms because they were from a different part of Canada. And I remember you texted me and I think my question back to you was, are these things that you are anticipating are going to be an issue? Or has there been evidence of these things that would cause you to kind of kill the deal right now? So maybe just kind of take us through what were the early parts of the discussion? Because I think from a competitive positioning standpoint, um, they had reached out to you because another, there was some growth from another competitor into their markets and they felt threatened by that. 
So then it kind of as a, as a counterplay, it kind of reached out to you. So maybe take, take us into some of these early parts of the negotiation because this may or may not be relevant to you. I have some idea, but I know lots of female business owners and perceived and very direct slights and how that messes with your head. And, and are the, is this a negotiation tactic or is this just being an idiot dude who doesn't know how to treat people, which are both very real possibilities at any given point in time in the construction industry. And I would say on the globe in general, speaking as an often idiot man myself. So maybe just take us into these early parts of the conversation. You're exhausted. You were drained. You're thinking, Hey, this could be interesting. I'm open to this. And yet there's some of this other, other tension that's also in those early discussions. Yeah, thanks. So you're right. All of these points, having been at the table with the men for a long time, even before I owned the business, I was aware of what it took to be heard. And I was aware that my values were a little bit different. And I'm not afraid to say that my values in business were a little bit different than lots of different people I encountered. Um, and that sometimes made it feel as though I wasn't being taken as seriously. And so I walked into this going, will I be taken seriously? And it won't, it doesn't matter to me necessarily if they take me seriously, so long as I show up in the way that feels most informed and competent and thoughtful. I cannot control what they're thinking or doing. So I really wanted to go in and which is of course why I texted you. I wanted to go in being thoughtful, like what is it I need to be thinking about here as we move on? So in our initial conversation, my my drive was really to ask questions because we know this from sales. What we do is we ask questions. And for me, the negotiation wasn't that different. I needed to understand why they were making this phone call, why we were having this meeting. And in fact, in the initial meeting, the, the request was not necessarily to buy the business, but would I be willing to partner with them? And what I did is they, they made this request to me, would, you know, we could partner together. And I said, listen, every single day I go to the office and I drew a little square on their table. I drew like a one inch square. Every day I go to the office and I squeeze my butt into that chair. And I can tell you there is no room for all three of us in that chair. <laughs> if you guys want in to the chair, you can buy it, but I don't want to share. And I knew in that moment, it was like everything just really crystallized that it was good that the question was asked because it got me to realize I, I would never want that. And so I, I, I clicked into, yeah, I, I could sell the business actually. And so I just started to ask questions. And I think that in a negotiation, it can be really easy when you're exhausted and burnt out to jump ahead to like, oh my God, this is here. I don't want to lose this chance. Mm -hmm. You know, FOMO kicks in. We want to do everything to make the sale work. But if we can take a step back and just ask the big questions, ask the powerful questions that can lead clarity, we can understand what the priorities are on both sides so that our negotiation can be so much easier it can be so much easier. So it became evident that, like you said, there was a competitor who was, there was a perceived impingement in their territory and they had wanted to be in Ontario for a long time. And they saw this as their chance to do that because when they tried before, it was hard to do that from Quebec. It's a province that has a different language. They speak French, if your clients aren't aware of that. And so it can be different for the crossover. You can't just go into another territory where there's a different language. It doesn't work. The cultural norms, like you said, are completely different. Uh, shipping is fine. It's not that. It's not the logistics. It really is the cultural issues. So they saw this as a way into the province that was in alignment with their business. And the, pro the products were almost all the same. So it gave them access to these key products. There was some really important pieces that clicked in for them. And there was the fear of the impingement. And that was a really important piece. And, you know, I think we can get information like this that can be useful in our selling process. And it can be a tool rather than a weapon if we're all working in the same way. So I've noticed... From the beginning, I always thought you always struck me as someone who was a very good listener. And I asked you, like, was this just something that's innate? Uh, is this something you were born with? Did you develop it? You came back with an answer that said something about Quaker-based council work training. And my general response to this was, what? 
So <laughs> tell me a little bit about the Quaker-based council work training. What What is all that? Yeah, so I'm sure you'll have people who are much more familiar and have in-depth knowledge of uh, Quakerism than I do. But in Quakerism, there's an understanding that everyone has a direct access. Everyone receives information directly from, you may call that God or spirit or whatever you say. And the council process is one where we think about a group of people sitting in a circle and we imagine that there is a leader in every single one of those chairs. It's non-hierarchical in nature. And so we take an approach and I, I actually moved my sales team to a council-based process a long time ago to try to work through difficult issues together, understanding, I mean, council work works the same way Google does. I mean, we draw from the wisdom of the crowd and we support. In the council process, we support each other, but we don't give advice and we don't rescue. We practice deep listening. We practice understanding and we practice asking good questions. And this is not rocket science. Every salesperson should know how to do these things. But we get so excited sometimes about hearing ourselves talk and saying brilliant things that we forget to stop and listen and ask questions. We forget understanding. Yes, this whole, I was chuckling, just well, certainly think of myself on occasion, or maybe most of the time, but certainly with some of, some of our clients and people that I've become really good friends with. But the idea that we wouldn't give advice and we wouldn't, <laughs> we, would you, did you say, was it rescueism with the idea of coming and rescuing, like being the hero. And we talk about this all the time because I think people become really successful in life through their own efforts and then leading organizations. They do that through problem solving. I see this issue. I can solve it. I bring these people together. I think about this. We solve this problem. I move on. And then you do that over and over and over again. All of a sudden, daily life just becomes a series of I've been in this situation before. Step aside, kids. Let me address this issue. And which is, <laughs> seems like the exact opposite of what you're describing, but it's often like, just stop, just listen, ask some powerful questions. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned if you ask some powerful questions, you can learn so much and get further faster. What, what might be an example, maybe from your negotiation or just in general, that would fall into the category of a powerful question you're referring to? Well, I think one example I can, I can give is, is just the question of what is it about Urban Hearth that's made you phone and want to buy my business? It, to me, you would never sell your business without asking that question, but I don't know if that's true or not. And I don't know that people are, are taking a step back to ask the what and how questions. We get so obsessed with the why questions and why questions are really difficult. They put people on the defense. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it makes you feel like you're being questioned. Why are you doing that? What is it about that that makes you feel so strongly? These are very different questions. And if we can learn to differentiate the questions, we can really start to have access to, to good relationship with people and to really clear understanding. And you have to have that in negotiation. I really, that is one thing that, if I've come out of it with anything, it's that clarity and understanding. And listen, I did not do it perfectly. There are a few things that I wish I had clarified more and understood more deeply. But at the early stages, it really went a long way to understanding what it is that could be that we could collaborate on and where we could come together to make some negotiations that would actually serve both of us. Yeah, I found that the start with why, and I know Simon Sinek, big fan. It seems like you can't talk to anybody for more than 24 hours with someone referring to or citing a video or a TEDx talk or a book by Cynic. But I feel like the start with why is very powerful when it's internal. You can ask yourself these questions and then you can wrestle with the fact like, man, this isn't a really good answer. I got to do some more digging. When you do that externally and I say things like, well, why? Why are those core values? Why is this? You're right. It comes across challenging sometimes. It can be perceived as disrespectful. Now, you start talking about kind of cultural norms. I've spent a lot of time in, living in Mexico, feel very comfortable with some of these Hispanic cultural norms. French Canadian, no idea. I just know I'm not a Francophone, so I can't go to Quebec. I'm not sure if that's the tourism slogan, but that's the way I'm perceiving it. So <laughs> maybe... Walk me through just a little bit as this negotiation got underway, you kind of felt this transition to, hey, this could really be good. And I remember there was some 
as there always is. There's some friction, there's some hiccups along the way. And I remember asking you, what does it feel like to imagine you putting aside a future that is not with the business and you are back leading this business and you're back in there like, like this never happened. What was your answer to that? Boy, I wish I had a script of that. I can't, I, it was probably something like, oh my God, no, stop. no, 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 <laughs> stop. But, you know, once I imagined that I could release that internal pressure, that I could turn that valve up a little and just release the pressure, I got a, I got a little attached to the idea. Well, I think once you have that, that idea of a bigger future, that is something different. And all of a sudden you weren't, it's probably unhealthy to think about those if you're not willing to act upon them. So we almost like close it off either consciously or subconsciously, but once it's out there and we have some other friends who had these opportunities, in some cases, it got to the one yard line, the deal fell apart. And you just look at them, the shoulders are down and they're deflated and they're like, mentally, they, they already moved on and to go backwards now. So then it's okay. Kind of back to the big questions. Like, what do you want? What gets you excited? And Hey, a million dollars here and there. Yeah. That stuff's really important, but not if it's making you miserable. Can we talk a little bit about concessions? This is something you and I went back and forth quite a bit on and obviously something that I'm very passionate about just in terms of effective negotiations and being creative combined with listening to try to find ways to maybe get you what you want, where everybody seems to be so fixated on what's the, whatever, seven figure, eight figure, what's that big number that is going to represent whether or not, you know, and it's kind of a, that's kind of a win-lose situation because if, it's, if I'm happy about it, you're probably not. And then vice versa. So what sort of concessions were you thinking about or were you able to execute that helped really further the deal? Yeah, this was, uh, this was something that I learned a lot from you actually was that a concession, concession doesn't have to be a bad word. doesn't have to be a swear word that we can make concessions and right. <laughs> it can actually really be helpful. Yeah. Uh, so in our negotiations, we spent some time talking about price and we spent a lot of time, you know, like the accountant has a formula and their people have a formula and you have a formula. Everybody's got these formulas for what a business is worth and they all come out with drastically different numbers. And that made me suspicious. That made me very suspicious. I was like, this is like, this is not concrete. <laughs> I don't yeah. like it when I don't like that. <laughs> and so we ended up just having these conversations and it became evident to me that they were really, they were fixated on a certain purchase price. And I was fixated on getting the value for my business and for my inventory. And the purchase price that they wanted devalued my inventory in a way that I just was not comfortable with. And so the concession that I suggested that we ended up moving forward with was that we go with a certain purchase price and that the working capital adjustment be here, set at a level that I knew where my working capital adjustment would be. The value was set in a certain place. So I knew that I was going to get the working capital adjustment that would value my inventory properly at the end of it. The extra bonus for that was they got to take advantage of later money. <laughs> they got mm -hmm. to pay for my business. And when we did the financial statements, they got to pay for the working capital adjustment later. And so this did not cost me anything. This landed me at a price I was happy with. It landed them at a price they were happy with. And in the end, it all, it all just worked out. The money was paid. Everyone was happy. This deal was signed. Hands are washed of the whole thing. So, and I make it sound easy and it wasn't. It was also a full year to get to the place where the deal was completely done. And so the concession was great. And I'm really advocating here for a lot of patience and for business owners who are trying to sell their business. So all in all, it was, you know, a year and three quarters from the beginning of the, the first conversation to the final piece of paper being signed. How did you manage your expectations throughout this because i'll just uh a couple of weeks ago got a call and somewhat there's a lot of similarities between where you probably were about two years ago or so and uh we were wrapping up the phone call he says he said, i'm excited he's like i do expect this to move pretty quickly from here and i said <laughs> hey take this at face value man i know you're excited about it, it does seem like a great fit I'm like, do not set those expectations. And now you can hang up the phone and say, Hartman's a jackass. I'm going to ignore everything he said. But I'm like, set the expectations. It's going to be longer and harder than you ever imagined. 
And therefore, if it's not, then great. Like the expectation that things are going to move quickly, I think you might be setting yourself up for some potential heartache that's unnecessary. And this is just purely inside your own head, you know? Um, How did you do that with yourself? So I had and have a fantastic accountant. He's a CPA, a certified professional accountant. He is one of my most, I just admire him so much. And he and I share a lot of business values. We have a lot of great conversations. And he told me, and I believed him the best I could. And then I would do the self-care things that I need to do outside of work, you know, like when the stress comes, like how do we handle stress as business owners when it comes? Because not only are we running our business and trying to keep it successful, we're also trying to sell it. And we're trying to have a family and home and all of these different things. And so I heard him when he told me it was going to be hard. He checked in all the time. I talked about how hard it was. I got support that was helpful. I talked to a counselor about it because it was a really difficult process. And I meditated and I went out in nature And, you know, I did the things that I needed to do to take care of myself, but no, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to see the deadline constantly moving. That was the hard part, actually. It wasn't hearing it's going to take a long time. It was hearing, okay, it's going to take a long time, but that's probably going to be this long. You know, my accountant wasn't telling me this, but the, the, the buyers are like, okay, well, we think this and we think that, and they're putting these kind of timelines on things. And then it was constantly moving you know, another month, another month, we need another month, we need another month. So that perseverance in that last six months was especially complicated. And so I I can't say enough about receiving outside support during that time, because I don't know, I'm sure there's other business owners like me out there that have a lot of close relationships with their staff and a family-like environment. And I just wasn't in a position to share the potential sale at that point. And only uh, my operations manager and my brother who worked for me knew about this because they were going to be kind of staying on in a management, in a man- they needed them to be managing the business essentially. So it was, it was really complex to be running my business, keeping it profitable, selling my business, keeping secrets from some of my closest people and trying to have a life outside of that. Well, wouldn't you describe it that way? Yeah, it it doesn't sound easy at all. Not at all. Um, (laughs) How were you able to control your emotions and then your subsequent actions? Because every time they said, oh, it's going to be another month. Now, there's some volition here where you can say, actually, it's not, right? I'm going to put the foot down and I'm going to say, if this isn't done by this date, the whole deal's off, right? Did that ever come up as you saw? kind of that that deadline, the finish line moving, or no, obviously, <laughs> there's pros and cons to there. That, that's a dangerous game to, to be played. But how did you think through that? And I think ultimately, the path you chose was successful because you got where you wanted to be. But how did you think about that in the moment when they're letting it slide? And you kind of chose deliberately not to put your foot down and say, here's the deadline. Yeah, well, part of it was that I actually really wanted to get through the calendar year of owning my business because that's some of my most profitable time. So part of it for me was that strategically, it was actually a benefit to me for the deal not to be done until February 1st. Um, So we've just passed a one year anniversary of that. So that was great. I knew that that would be a benefit to me. I knew that I could, I was going to make more money getting the profit from my inventory selling than I was from it selling to them at cost. Sure. So that was important. And so I kept having to remind myself that that was more important than the sale being done and constantly stepping back and asking my feelings if, you know, they're real. Are you, what are you about? That's really important to me. I have a certain set of values and my alignment with those is not always great if something, if something in a moment catches me in a reactive way and I have to actually step back from that and go, wait a minute, what, what's happening here? And I have had my values tested like everybody more times than I can count. And I know that that's how we get clear on our values. I a hundred percent know that our values are what we do when we're under pressure, when things get difficult, the actions that we take, those are our values. 
And so when this was happening, I actually had to take a 360 view and say, well, what's it like for them? They're trying to buy a business in this reasonably small window. It's a business in a province that they don't live in. So they have to find a new lawyer that is in Ontario because this is where the jurisdiction they're buying the business in. And so looking at the complexities that the other party is facing and taking that kind of 360 view can be really helpful to take a step back. So there was a strategic piece, but there was also just the the humanity piece of like buying a business is hard. Let's give these guys a little space. We're not Mm going to let it stretch out for years and years, but we are going to give them a little extra time here because it's actually reasonably fast. It is my understanding from my lawyer and my accountant now that these deals can take eons to complete. Mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful, but it's also hard to do is when you have all this strain and pressure bearing down on your own shoulders and living inside your own head to be able to say yes. And what is it like for them? What are they dealing with? Um, Physical challenges of transportation and traveling over here to yes, new people that maybe they don't trust that, that are really going to make an impact on the business. Like you mentioned the, the lawyer, et cetera, but to give them, give yourself that perspective, I also think is very humanizing. I also think it's really hard I can imagine the other hard thing, knowing how close you were with your staff, having your brother work there, carrying those secrets around. How did you manage these difficult feelings of knowing you're going to be leaving your team and going on to something completely else? Yeah, I can honestly say that's one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I still, I still have a lot of feelings about it that I'm dealing with. It's it, that has not come to an end for me yet. So telling my staff that this was happening happened just before Christmas when the business was selling February 1st. And I had taken each one of them aside individually and talked to them one-on-one and then had a group discussion about it because I wanted everyone to have the safety to be, I mean, I think people would have safety in that group, but I really wanted them to have the one-on-one respect, I guess, of this matters to me. I want you to know this one-on-one. This is why I'm doing this. This is how I'm doing this. This is when I'm doing this. What are your questions? And then we had a discussion as a group. And honestly, there was a grieving process that I've had to go through. I'm still friends with all of these people, but you know, when you step back out of being in that role, you step back from the team, you lose that intimacy of the day-to-day that you get with people you work with that can be so powerful And that's something that I've really had to grieve. And I think acknowledging that there's a grieving process and then actually doing it are really important for people who are in massive transition and selling a business is a massive transition. Absolutely. Well, I would like to dig into something that you brought up and I think is extremely powerful. You experience in your local community, our construction industry as a whole, I would say this is an ongoing epidemic. So I want to go maybe just a little bit heavier before we finish on a lighter note here, but do you mind sharing just what happened with a business leader in your local community that you knew and how you're processing that? Yeah. Last week, a really prominent business owner in our community uh, completed suicide. And this came as a massive shock to our community. And the thing that's really resonating for me in this, I mean, there's a lot, there's so much that's resonating, but one of the big things as a former business owner is that we do have a tendency to internalize burdens. We feel accountability and responsibility for so much. And we are trying to run our business. We're trying to care for our employees. We're trying to care for everything that we care about and be in a family and be in a community. And the pressure can be a lot. And I have definitely experienced laying awake at night, not knowing if the business is going to work, not knowing if I will succeed or fail and thinking about all the people that I'll fail if I don't do a good job. And I've internalized so many burdens and I know that those things can spiral and we see it. We see it with suicide and we see it with entrepreneurs who don't seek support. So I would just, if I could say anything to entrepreneurs who are feeling under a great deal of pressure, it's let let that pressure out, talk to somebody, get support, call a suicide hotline. I think you're going to share those numbers in some way with this for Canada and the US. Reach out to anybody who go to a counselor, go to a friend, go to a family member. 
this burden is not yours to carry alone. I would happily talk to any business owner anytime that feels that burden. And then the other thing I would say is just to be conscientious about the words we use with our fellow business owners, understanding that they are under so much pressure and the way that we can support each other by building community together and seeing ourselves as collaborators rather than competitors can be so helpful. Just changing our language about the people that we're in community with. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's really well said, Amber. Aaron Witt, who we had on the show, young guy, he's, I've been really impressed with him, just following him. And he put out a post on Instagram and he said, in 2020, the fatality rate for the construction uh, industry was 13.5 deaths per 100,000 workers. The suicide rate was at 50 per 100,000. The overdose rate was more than 162. Uh, that's 12 times the fatalities from on-the-job accidents. And he said, it's sickening. And I would say that from a human standpoint, I think the root cause is a lot a lot of the same things, whether you're a business owner and you have the opportunity to sell or a multi-generational business that is in a time of transition or you're struggling. Um, I certainly felt this myself in different ways. And I think it's not only when there are trials and tribulations. I also think there's this whole different set of pressures come for some really successful companies that have seen some incredible growth and have doubled the number of employees. But I think ultimately the point is how do we stay connected with people? And I've just uh, learned to kind of trust my gut. If you're like, why am I thinking about this person? I haven't talked to him in years, just sometimes to reach out. Um, and not to say I've done this recently and help somebody who was thinking about that, but just letting other people know you're thinking of them and giving them an outlet, um, especially for, I think, dudes in the construction industry. This isn't something we're hardwired to do, to share our feelings, to talk about the pressure that we're under. But I think we're seeing, in your case, a single statistic, and we're seeing them nationally. We've got to be doing something different. And I think as leaders, I think it's just, you know, hey, one interaction at a time. So I feel terrible. And that's brutal, but I appreciate you kind of sharing that here with, with our audience. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for letting it um, take up the space. It's really important. And again, just anytime anybody wants to talk, I would be so open and available to that. And I just understand those pressures and for women and men, and you're right, men don't voice it. And women get so much uh, flack if they have any kind of power and it's really, really tricky and damaging. So, you know, use your words kindly and reach out to the people you care about or don't even really know. Yeah, what what would be the best way? So if we have people who are listening that wanted to take you up on that offer, what is the best way to reach you, Amber? You can find me on LinkedIn under Amber Percival. Perfect, all right. We're going to end with a little bit of a lighter note. I know you spend a lot of time in nature. I had told you that given the amount of time, increasingly that I found myself in this little office, I am uh, <laughs> reach around here. Um, I'm trying to deliberately bring in a little bit of nature inside. Literally a leaf just fell off now. That's a bad sign. So if I wanted to, now this is a, this is a ficus tree of some varieties. Does this, this look right to you? All right. Well, good. All right. Because uh, I almost forgot the name. I bought it a week ago. So far, it's living. I've read up on it. I actually bought a, a little uh, got a little sprayer. I was used to just dumping water in with a cup, and they're like, no, you can't do that. You got to look. You, obviously, if this is audio only, you cannot see what I'm holding. I'm holding a little, uh, what is this, a spritzer? What do you call this in the uh, plant world? It's, a, it's Barbie pink. It's a Barbie pink water spritzer. It's very on trend. I love that for you. You know what? I was hoping you were going to let that go. I asked my wife because I bought this new plant and I want to kill it. I need a little spritzer. And this is what came. And I didn't even question it until, of course, you call me out on it. It is Barbie pink. That is correct. What other plants might I consider if I wanted to up my plant game in here in ways? <laughs> Another leaf just fell off. I should stop handling it. What, uh, what other plants might be durable in here that wouldn't make me feel worse about myself? You know, if I were to accidentally kill them. Is there any windows in that space at all? There are, yes. Uh, very indirect light, though. Good. Okay. A snake plant would be a good choice. Okay. How I'll big is a snake picture. plant? It's got, it, well, it can start very small and it can get very large, but has all these individual tall, 
it's it's beautiful and it's okay. very difficult to kill. And Perfect. so care, care is exceptionally easy for this plant. Okay. I highly recommend. And it's called a snake plant. So what could be cooler than that? It makes you sound badass. You don't have to spritz it. Non non spritzing snake plant. You can just pour a cup of water on it. I think that's it's what very, I'm looking for. I think, it's, like, I think it's friendly. You started with something very very difficult, which doesn't totally surprise me. <laughs> I love that for you. I would suggest you stop moving it to and fro. They're very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to know. I don't know. It was there. I'm like, this looks awesome. And I asked the guy at Ikea, as a matter of fact, because that is, Ikea is the best place to buy plants. And he's like, yeah, no, you'll be fine. I'm like, all right. And I look, I get home and they're like, this is moderate to really difficult to, I'm like, well, that's how we go. Uh, all right. Snake plant. You got a backup to that? Oh, and Monstera would be good. They look cool. They can do indirect light and they're really easy to care for. What? Who? Monstera. M-O-N-S-T-E-R-A. Monstera. All right. Cool. By the way, is it normal that there'd be like little bugs or tiny little gnats that are in this no. thing? What? No, don't, don't bring any more plants home until you get that dealt with. No, they started here. Now these things are a little like buzzing. Or they're literally annoying me right now as I, as I close out this yeah. podcast. I'm just going to, I'm just going to burst one bubble here. And I think that buying a plant from Ikea is a bit like buying a wood stove from Home Depot. I'm supposed to interpret that. That's not the way to go. That is not, they're not the local expert on such products. Is that what you're saying to me? Don't, don't buy the lumber for your house from the, re, from the reuse store. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate the analogy. And uh, <laughs> I think both you're right and my feelings are hurt. So Amber, first of all, um, I, I really enjoyed getting to know you several years ago, and you've always been thoughtful, and uh, oftentimes talking to you about your business is a fantastic way for me to synthesize how to improve my own, and um, I'm really excited for you and whatever is next, and congratulations on all your success. I appreciate you making time for me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. All right, then, friends, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Amber Percival. I really cherish our friendship, and I always find that she's a really thoughtful listener. And in a very subtle way, she helps me become a better leader and manager. So hopefully you got at least one or two things from that. As we closed out talking about suicide, I know that can be heavy and there's a lot of emotions that go with it. And I know from a podcasting experience, it's probably not exactly what you want to listen to. That being said, say nothing is more important than us being thoughtful and generous and courageous with the people around us. So if nothing else, I'd like you to just take a minute today, shut the phone off and just think about the people that you care about most, both personally and professionally, and maybe just other people in your orbit that are having a tough time and take a second to send them an email, make a quick phone call, shoot them a text, do something just to let them know that they are not alone. I think Amber is 100% accurate when she notes that a lot of owners are under incredible amounts of pressure that a lot of people don't know about, people that work close with them or related to them, and they just kind of choke it down. And as leaders, sometimes they think they are not able to share how they're feeling. And that results in some really, really terrible outcomes. So take a minute today, think about the people that you care about most and other people in your network that you know are going through a tough time. Send a little note, let them know that there are always ups and downs in life. So I'm going to close out there. Thank you for listening. We will close out with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first, make it a great week.